I've come to realize that with the way I do book reviews, I should probably be giving spoiler warnings. So here's a spoiler warning to be fair. Pretty much every book review I do is going to spoil pretty much the entire plot. Now today I'm reviewing The Oath by Frank Peretti, so let's get into it. Peretti is a Christian author. He's best known for This Present Darkness, which is a fiction book that depicts literal demons, servants of Satan, going around and causing chaos at the same time that the story is unfolding in the physical world. And the same author wrote another book, a sequel to that called Piercing the Darkness, and he also wrote several other books. Other books with not quite the same idea, but with similar use of Christian themes and books that illustrate spiritual warfare in a similar way. Books that bring into the physical, tangible world the effects of things that demons do, or the effects of things that angels do. So this is a book by a Christian author for a Christian audience. And I just want to take a moment to mention the names in this book. I did go into it knowing that I would be doing a book review about this, and so so with that in mind, I took notes on all the names as I went. Now, if I hadn't been taking notes, I don't think I would have been able to realistically keep track of all the names. So I'll do my best as we go on here to keep the listener able to follow along with all the names in the plot. And this book is a little bit of a mystery book, too. People always put Peretti in the horror genre, but I like to think of these books as mystery novels. Things that you get clues and you have to try and unravel the thing before the plot reveals. The plot makes it absolutely obvious that what's happening. Happening. I'll get into it at the end why I think this book among Peretti books is a bit of an outlier, but nevertheless I will try to keep you in suspense as to the main point for as long as I can. Now the book starts out with a few interesting scenes. It sort of puts us into the action before it explains what the action is. It's set in a small town closer to the west coast, and we see a character, Maggie Blythe, getting kicked out of her house, and she goes to one of the neighbors, one of the other people in town, his name is Vic, to try and get shelter. Vic turns her away, saying, quote, don't bring it in here, end quote. So then Maggie's forced to go somewhere else, and we're left to wonder where she ends up. Meanwhile, we see Evelyn Benson running through the woods. Her husband, Cliff Benson, has been killed during a camping trip in quite a brutal, grotesque way. Evelyn, in the beginning parts of the book, is either unconscious or doesn't remember much. So meanwhile, the prime suspect in this murder is a bear. And meanwhile, the book shifts over to the same character, Vic, that turned Maggie away. And he is shown looking in the mirror at a black mark above his heart on his chest, and he seems to be fretting about this mark. Now, Dr. Steve Benson, who is a wildlife expert, and the brother of Cliff Benson, who was murdered, is the one who ends up investigating Cliff's death. And one of the first things he does, along with the other people who are investigating this, is going on the autopsy conclusion that this was a bear attack. They go and bait, trap, and kill one of the grizzly bears that's known to be living in the area. That is bear number 318, nicknamed Herman. They do an autopsy on the bear as well, and they find no trace in the contents of the bear's stomach that it attacked any human recently. So in light of that, Steve goes back and re-examines the evidence. Evelyn at this point is awake, but she doesn't remember everything about the attack. She remembers events before and after the attack pretty clearly, but she does not remember the attack itself. One thing, however, they do have to go on is that the tip of Evelyn's hunting knife that she was carrying when she was running away from the attack, the tip was broken off. Now, examining the condition of Cliff's body itself, they found that the body had been cut pretty cleanly in two, including the pelvis bone had been cut straight through. It was the top of his body that was missing, so he was missing his head, most of his torso, and one arm. They still had the other arm, so they ran the fingerprints and it did match. Cliff's fingerprints from other times he'd been fingerprinted. His vital organs, from what they could tell, were still intact, at least the ones that they still had access to. They did not find the hair of any animal, nor the teeth, nor any kind of claw mark. They noted when they were examining the actual crime scene, the bear would usually go to the abdomen first. Bears tend to bite and drag their victims off. And this particular attack was too messy for a bear. It was compared to something that might have happened in an accident involving a lumber mill saw. So we have quite a puzzling set of clues so far. So the next thing Steve does is team up with one of the locals of this town, Tracy Ellis, in order to investigate this more. Steve goes to the local bar and asks around about what might have been responsible for this attack, meets another character of note, a big bearded man named Levi, who tells him, quote, ain't nobody here in this town that's innocent. 
end quote. Learns later from other characters, including Tracy, that Levi is considered the religious nut of the town. He is one who believes in Old Valley superstitions. But strangely, though, he's the only one that seems willing to answer any questions. Steve ends up visiting Levi's home, and here's where we find something a little bit interesting. Maggie, the girl from the beginning who was kicked out of her house, did end up sheltering with Levi. Levi seems to have been the only one willing to take her in, and Steve, now being at Levi's house, has the unique opportunity of interviewing this character Maggie, finds out that Maggie and Cliff Benson actually had an affair going on. They did plan to elope. Maggie planned to leave Harold, her husband. Cliff planned to leave Evelyn, his wife. And a quote from Maggie, quote, Cliff got eaten alive, now the same will happen to me, end quote. A mysterious quote that's not really elaborated on quite yet. Levi tells Steve that Maggie's sins will follow her anywhere she goes. She won't be safe by just leaving town and running away to safety. She needs to confess her sins. So again, if you are the character of Steve, this might be pretty confusing so far. And it gets a little more confusing for the reader when we see in the next scene Maggie going out in the middle of the night with the black mark on her chest that's at this point it's oozing pus. This is the same kind of black mark that we've seen Vic to have. So she's out in the middle of the town making noise, waking people up, waking up the neighbors, wakes up Harold, her husband, and tells Harold in front of the whole town about her affair with Cliff. Here's an exact quote, I can do what I want, I can go where I want, I can be with whoever I want, it doesn't matter anymore, end quote. She says that she is free. And then the very next morning, Maggie is missing only her hand pag and a puddle of blood is ever found. And now we flash over to Steve getting back to his investigation once more, talking to the sheriff of the town, Sheriff Collins. The sheriff is trying to tell Steve that the autopsy is conclusive and the bear is obviously the one that killed Cliff, obviously. But Steve doesn't quite buy that. In fact, one of the things Steve does is he takes a sample of the saliva that was found at the site of Cliff's murder, and he sends it off to one of his friends in a biology lab to get it tested. The results of that saliva come back saying it's not a human, it's not a bear, in fact it's not an exact match for any known animal that they're able to identify. It probably belongs to some kind of reptile. And around the same time that Steve gets this news, we see Tracy open up a little bit more. Tracy Ellis being the sheriff's deputy who's been assisting Cliff, telling Steve that the town took an oath of secrecy generations ago. Quote, there are folks in the valley who believe that there's a big dragon up there, a dragon that eats people, unquote. That superstition sounds like quite a coincidence in light of these murders. And what makes it even more silly funny, Steve gets a phone call from a mystery person with a disguised voice, talking in a French accent, and this mystery person is trying to convince Steve that he needs to go out and hunt and kill this dragon. Now Steve, being confused as he is, goes to see one of the few people who's ever given him answers so far he goes back to see Levi. Levi tells him that he's a hundred years too late to kill the dragon. Guns won't kill this creature. Steve decides that he wants to go and investigate Hyde Hall, which is the place in town where a lot of the people who disappear have gone before they disappeared, and Levi goes there to join him. Levi tells Steve during this scene that Hyde Hall is usually the place that people go to meet the dragon, and he tells him also that the dragon is about 45 feet long. And it's at this point that some people meet Steve there, and they inform him that this is private land, he should probably leave. These people try to gaslight him a little, tell him that Maggie and Vic are probably okay. Vic being another person who recently disappeared, they try to tell Steve that Levi is just a crazy man. In fact, a crazy man that has something in particular against Harold Bly. Now, what are they to do with the information they have so far? Well, Steve and Tracy decide that they're going to try and repeat the circumstances of the attack. They're going to go out alone at night to Hyde Hall, and while they're doing this, they see eyes in the woods watching them. They see a big animal that starts flying towards them. They start shooting at it with shotguns, and then they follow the animal through the woods until they find the remains of a dead bear. And then Levi, guessing at least some of what's going on, follows them. Cut over to a quick cutscene. There's a character, Charlie Matt, who happens to have been the man with the fake French accent, and he seems to be having chest pain and a similar mark to what the other characters have gotten so far. Back over to Steve. Levi is showing Steve through the woods. Levi is showing Steve the tracks of the dragon in itself. Levi is telling Steve that the dragon doesn't like being around him. Now Steve the next day goes to visit Charlie Mack, the character I mentioned who has a new mark, and Charlie is sort of panicking at this point because he knows he's marked. Charlie reveals that the Hyde family made a deal with the dragon years ago. 
Harold Blythe happening to be a descendant of this Hyde family. And next we see another character, Phil Garrett, who at this point also has that chest mark, and Phil happens to be talking to Harold Blythe about it. Harold advises Phil that the dragon needs to be appeased. Phil can make an offering to the dragon by killing one of the witnesses of the dragon's attacks. That would be none other than Evelyn Benson. If you're following along, Evelyn is the wife of Cliff Benson, the first one we've seen to get murdered. Throughout his time interviewing people in the town, he runs across a local preacher who says that Levi Cobb is disliked because he puts the dragon in religious terms. So people around town see that Steve is spending time with Levi, and they lump him into the same box. Guilt by association, basically. The preacher then briefly mentions a massacre that occurred in 1882, in which the Hyde clan had a conflict with another group of people over who would ultimately control the town, and the Hyde family, the ancestors of Harold Bly, won that engagement, and the other clan got literally butchered. Now, if you remember a couple scenes back, Harold tells somebody that he needs to appease the dragon by killing Evelyn, and that way the black spot on his chest will disappear. Hopefully. Maybe. We'll see. Well, that guy does attack Evelyn, fails to kill her, in fact, worse than that, for Harold at least. Through the attack, Evelyn starts getting flashbacks of what really happened during the dragon attack on her husband. She remembers that she stabbed the dragon and the knife tip broke off inside of the dragon. Steve then comes to talk to Evelyn and gets that information. Charlie Mack, meanwhile, the guy who was using the fake French accent, is attacked by the dragon and he dies. I realize this is feeling like I'm giving just a dry play-by-play -play of all the events in the book. I promise we're getting to the point. So we see a scene now where Harold Bly discovers he himself has the mark of the beast. Tracy then talks to Harold and questions him about Phil Garrett attacking Evelyn Benson. Phil, the guy that tried to kill Evelyn, then calls Harold, and Harold tells him to come to the factory. Harold then calls Tracy to come and arrest Phil, because of course Phil attacked somebody, and Tracy is the sheriff's deputy. And Harold seems to think that by doing this, he himself will appease the dragon. Steve, meanwhile, is visiting a hermit up in the mountain named Jules, on the assumption that this hermit, living in the woods, has seen more of the dragon than anyone else in town. Jules, in fact, has seen the dragon. Jules can confirm the dragon does breathe fire. He knows approximately where the dragon lives, and he has an object that appears to be one of the scales from the dragon, and he demonstrates how the scale can change color and camouflage itself depending on its surroundings. Nice. So the dragon, especially at nighttime, will appear invisible to anyone looking for it. Except for those eyes. Those haunting eyes. So Steve, like any white frat boy in a horror movie, goes to investigate the dragon's nesting location. He finds half of a flannel shirt, but no dragon. However, when he goes to leave, the dragon comes in behind him. He tries to shoot it with a shotgun, but the dragon takes the gun away, breathes fire at him, and then it seems to just let him go. The dragon does not kill him, even though it has every chance to do it. Meanwhile, Tracy comes to meet Phil at the tavern, arrests him, takes him to jail, gives Phil a jail cell with a window, and Phil starts freaking out. Tracy knows exactly why. Phil believes that the dragon will come in through the window and eat him, because Phil, of course, knows that he has the mark. Steve, meanwhile, goes back to visit Levi Cobb. Levi shows Steve a diary from the 1880s written by Holly and Mayfield. I don't know why Levi didn't show them this diary to begin with, but that's beside the point. The diary talks about a Reverend Charles Dubois and Ben Hyde people who lived way back when. Ben had a problem with the whole morality thing, and ultimately the Reverend ended up hanging from a tree by his neck. He was framed, and all of Dubois' friends are killed, attacked, and chased away by angry mobs. So that's the history of the town that we're dealing with. Tracy, meanwhile, visits Steve Benson. Steve tells her what he knows about the dragon, and she takes him to her house for a, uh, shower. They, uh, they, they do the dirty. Despite knowing that Tracy is in a loveless marriage, Steve does the dirty with her. And the very next morning, he wakes up with a mark, and he doesn't know what it is. Do the listeners know what it is? I think you might. Harold, meanwhile, is trying to think of a better offering for the dragon, because he realizes he's not in control of the dragon. He has lost control of the situation. Tracy, the next morning, goes to the sheriff's office and finds Phil dead in his cell. The sheriff actually attacks and tries to handcuff her. She fights back, however, and she ends ends up shooting the sheriff, but she did not shoot the deputy because she was the deputy. Upon investigating the sheriff's body, she finds that the sheriff also had the mark of the dragon. I mean, who doesn't? Levi, meanwhile, talks to Steve again, and he notices Steve's new scar. And this is where Levi explains what we probably all at this point knew. The dragon is the physical manifestation of sin. And, direct quote, the dragon isn't God's judgment for sin, the dragon is sin, unquote. Another quote, sin never works for anybody, they work for it. 
end quote. So the main point the author is trying to drive home here is sin kills. Whether it's in the form of a dragon, or a metaphorical dragon, or whether we're just facing the consequences of our actions, sin kills. And sin grows when you feed it. Over the years, the dragon has grown quite a bit. And as a matter of fact, no matter how much we think we're in control, when we give ourselves up to sin, we become slaves to sin. Which is something that I'll talk about more in a quite lengthy book review that I have scheduled for probably next week. Now, in this monologue as well, an ancient town motto is revealed, quote, if this be sin, let sin be served, unquote. And that town motto dates all the way back to the time where that reverend was killed and all his followers were driven out of town. Wonderful. Something else that points to humans thinking that we know best, humans thinking that each person's interpretation of morality, their own interpretation of morality is the be-all and the end-all, denying a universal truth and instead substituting our own truth, making ourselves into gods. Concepts that you'll likely be familiar with if you go to church regularly. Now, back to Tracy. She's in the police station standing over a dead body of the sheriff. Evelyn arrives at the station. She sees the mark on the body, and she remembers that Cliff had the same mark, and Tracy has the mark now. Now, back to Steve and Levi. Levi proposes a way to try and kill the dragon. The dragon is killing so many people all at once in such a short span of time, it has to be stopped. Levi proposes that they try to spear the dragon between its scales, and he notes that the dragon has only ever backed away from two people, Evelyn and Levi. They are both Christians. Levi says that the dragon fears Jesus Christ, and that the dragon saw Jesus Christ in the hearts of both Levi and Evelyn. And now Levi tells Steve about the marks and what they mean. We probably all know what they mean. I mean, the marks are the marks of sin. It's the marks of slavery that bind us to the dragon to sin. And now we see a scene that gets a little bit interesting, gets more to the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk about in this book. Steve goes to the local bar to meet Harold. Harold, of course, tells Steve to ignore the dragon, mind his own business, introduces Steve to a guy named Doug, but then Harold shows Steve his scar, the mark that he got from the dragon. And here's a direct quote, quote from Harold, we all try to hide it at first. Who are we kidding? Why hide anything when we all have it? We are what we are. So so we do what we do, and nobody needs to apologize. You get used to it." End quote. That's a really great illustration of what I think is one of the core points that the author is trying to get across, which is if you completely give yourself over to a state of sinfulness, if you resign yourself to it, if you tell yourself everyone does it, nothing to be ashamed of, if you tell yourself it's not a big deal, then that's when you're giving it the opportunity to grow more and eat up your life even more. Quote from Harold about Steve's brother, quote, in the end, he didn't care either. Nobody does. We don't, and neither should you, end quote. More about this idea of caring about being in a state of sinfulness. And here's the thing, Harold knows about Steve and Tracy, even though Tracy's married. Doug also happens to be Tracy's husband, the same Doug that is at the bar with them. And Harold tells Steve that his brother was an adulterer. Yes, Cliff Benson had the mark of the beast on him. He is a casualty of sin. Now, this builds up to a really tense moment in the bar when we think there's going to be pretty much Steve's murder going on. But then Tracy barges in with a gun, gets Steve out of there, and then that's when they realize Steve appears to be drugged. It's hard for him to walk. Nevertheless, they try to get into a car. Levi shows up and tries to intervene. Harold shoots Levi, and Steve passes out. Steve then wakes up later at Hyde Hall, chained to a rock so he can't move. Tracy apparently got away. Levi is with Steve, but not tied up. In fact, he played dead, and everybody there took him for dead so they didn't touch his body. But he brought some bolt cutters to Steve. However, Levi is very much about to die because he got shot. But using some of his final moments, Levi tells Steve to get right with God and scare the dragon away. Tracy, soon after, shows up with a pair of stolen horses. Yes, she comes on horseback and tries to get Steve out out of there. Meanwhile, we see the first of several scenes where Harold and his angry mob are going on a hunt for Levi's friends, all the people who go to church with him. And I think this part really echoes, or it's meant to echo, the descriptions we have of that 1882 massacre, where all the followers of that pastor were rounded up. So we see Christians getting torn out of their homes, Christians fleeing town, calling each other, warning each other. And then we flash over to Steve and Tracy on horseback going to meet the dragon. And Tracy starts acting pretty weird. Steve Steve realizes that she's no longer feeling any pain from her Mark of the Beast. She keeps talking about all the sex that she wants to have with Steve. And then the dragon flies in and takes Tracy. And that's when Steve has the important realization. Direct quote, something happens when you get this mark. You get used to it, and you don't care anymore. End quote. And this is really the important pivotal moment 
that was my takeaway from the book, is you have to care about whether or not you're doing things wrong. You can't just resign yourself to it, you have to treat it like it's a big deal, because it is a big deal. Next, we see more scenes where Christians are getting taken out of their homes. We see that people are calling up the pastor of the local church, and the pastor is telling people to flee and get out of town. And then we see an odd scene. We see the angry mob showing up at the pastor's door. The pastor greets them, but then he opens up his shirt and shows them that he also has the Mark of the Beast, and he says, I'll stay out of your way. And they, they leave. They leave him in peace. Now, the rest of the book feels a lot like an action scene that it feels like it would make a pretty good movie. Steve makes his way into the dragon lair and finds a room full of bones. Just the entire floor is covered with bones. Steve compares them to trophies, a century of trophies. Quote, For the people of Hyde River, who could say? Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but all were bound for the same end. Dried bones and dragon manure. End quote. Another creepy quote, He could hear the murmur of the bones. As you are, we once were. As we are, you soon will be. End quote. Something that would probably look better on a movie screen than hearing me describe it. So Steve explores the lair a little, and then he looks outside and he sees the silhouette of the dragon on the night sky, and he realizes the dragon does not see him. And of course, now that he's standing at the exit, he realizes that the cabin of that hermit, Jules Cryer, the guy who gave him the dragon scale, is literally right there, like right next to the exit. And all this time, apparently, he never knew how close he was to the dragon. We see Steve trying to get to the dragon without the dragon seeing him and eating him first. Quote from the book, as long as he kept calling on God, somehow the dragon couldn't seem to get a fix on him. End quote. We see Steve trying to set a trap for the dragon. He hides in the hermit's hut and sets up a bunch of the mine explosives that are there. The dragon, of course, finds Steve. He takes the roof off of the hut. Steve slips out through the secret escape tunnel, sets off the explosives on his way out, and the dragon gets hit by the explosion. The dragon, however, is not dead, but its scales seem to be malfunctioning. Steve, meanwhile, notices that the black spot on his chest, his own mark of the beast, is starting to dry up, and he starts to think of a plan. He decides he's going to take a shotgun and shoot it through the vulnerable spots in his scales while the dragon is stunned. And now, this is another interesting part of this book. Steve has a moment of doubt when he's right there close to the dragon. He could kill it in a second. He feels like he'd be killing part of himself, is how he describes it. He drops the gun, touches the scales, and begins to fall in love with it, and then his chest gets worse. And this, I think, echoes something that a lot of people feel. Giving up the part of sin that's in your own life is hard. It's giving up part of your life. It's giving up something that you've experienced, something that you've put hours and hours into. It feels like the death of knowledge. It feels like watching the Library of Alexandria get burned. And it is easy to feel sadness and sympathy for that knowledge, those experiences disappearing from the world, even though we know they don't lead to anything good. Steve, of course, though, breaks out of his stupor, realizes again that the dragon is evil, and he runs away trying to lure the dragon into town. Meanwhile, Harold, at the head of the mob that's trying to evict the Christians from town, is starting to realize he's lost control of the mob, and the mob is even starting to threaten his own property. Once again, another sign that we can't control sin no matter how much we want to, no matter how much we think at the beginning that we can. Steve, meanwhile, finds his way to the local church, and he sits down and prays. He asks for help against the dragon and against sin. He asks to be set free from the dragon, asks for victory. He gives his problems to God, is a good way to put it. The Reverend, meanwhile, finds Steve, tells him that guilt is the problem. The Reverend tells him to stop feeling guilty. And then Steve, of course, finds that the Reverend has his own black mark. Quote from what the priest tries to tell him, you don't need forgiveness from God, you can change yourself. There's no right or wrong except what we make up for ourselves, unquote. That doesn't sound like the Bible. The dragon, of course, at the most pivotal moment, bursts into the church. Steve runs away. He goes to Levi's house and gets that spear that Levi made, finds that it has been welded to an extension ladder and mounted on the back of a truck. And I have to imagine, I have to, like, think back on, I think the movie is called Twister or something like that. It's about storm chasers trying to, like, get this crate full of little data-gathering robots into the eye of a hurricane. The image of this ladder spear truck just evokes images of something as crazy and wild as that. This book would make a good movie. Anyway, flashback over to Harold. He starts shooting to get the mob's attention. The mob learns that Steve is driving and the dragon is rampaging through the town. Harold gets the crowd moving. Steve, meanwhile, takes advice from the dead Levi. 
drives into the tunnel and plans to stab at the dragon while the dragon is inside the tunnel. He goes in and he finds that the dragon is at one end of the tunnel and the mob is at the other end. Steve realizes that he needs to feel the faith in Jesus so that the dragon will be scared to approach him, the dragon will back away from him. And he puts the truck in the perfect position, he calls on Jesus, the back- he calls on Jesus, the dragon backs up, the dragon stabs itself on the spear while backing up, and everyone clapped. And that interaction between Steve and the dragon reminds me of, uh, something from James chapter 4, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is a passage that I go back to a lot. Quote Steve talking to the dragon, I won't bow down to you, you don't owe me not anymore, end quote. Harold, meanwhile, approaches Steve and starts gloating because Harold has a gun and Steve does not. It's, of course, at the pivotal, most critical, most action-packed, most suspense-filled moment where Harold points the gun at Steve, he's about to shoot, and then the dragon uses its very last bit of energy to reach out a claw and stab Harold through the heart. And then, in a flash of light, the dragon vanishes and Steve faints. I wonder how many times Steve has fainted in this book. Steve wakes up later, Evelyn is at the scene, and police are also at the scene. There's actually no evidence of the dragon's physical body left, except, of course, the tip of Evelyn's broken-off knife, which is laying on the ground nearby. Remember that knife that Evelyn broke at the very beginning of the book? Steve looks at his chest and realizes that the slime that was on his chest is now turning to dust. There's no mark left, there's no pain. Now, as far as what I'd like to extract from this book, I think a lot of it, the big points at least, God talked about when I was going through the plot, that is, the consequences of sin are death. You have to care about sinning, care about being in a state of sin. Don't resign yourself to it. Don't get rid of your guilt. In fact, embrace your guilt and use it to motivate yourself to get out of that state of sin. It's a really simple message, but in reading this book, it had a bigger effect on me. And like I said earlier, I wouldn't have expected this to be a book that the author wrote so late in his career compared to the others, because the message is so much more simple, but the simplicity of the message, I don't think that takes away from the impact of it, at least on this one singular reader, me. And I actually looked up the dates for the other books that he wrote, the ones that I read so far at least. This Present Darkness was one of his earliest ones. That was 1986 when that was published. Piercing the Darkness is the sequel to This Present Darkness. That was 1989. The Oath, this book, was 1995, and then The Visitation, a book that had a lot more developed mystery element to it and a lot more moving parts to the plot, and explored the main character's entire life story much more thoroughly. That book was 1999. So yeah, I would say compared to those other three books, this one feels like a bit of a curveball, but I think I like it.